my name is Michael Samuelian. I'm the founding director of the Urban Technology Hub here at Cornell Tech. And hubs, for those of you that are not familiar with what a hub is, we're essentially outward thinking think tanks. So we focus on real issues and bringing our research to applied technology areas. I consider a lot ecosystem engagement. So that's events like this, bringing people together uh, to talk about technology and cities, uh, which are two very near and dear issues uh, to my heart. And then lastly, we have, and maybe most importantly, we have a brand new two-year master's degree with a concentration in urban technology. And I'm really uh, thrilled to have some of our students, graduate students here. So those of you who are thinking about graduate school, we're gonna graduate our first cohort in May of this year, which we have uh, at least one representative with us today. So has everyone here heard of the rebooting NYC report? Anyone not, let me go the other way. Anyone not, had no idea what I'm talking about. Good, this is for you uh, and everyone else. So we issued a draft of this report back in May uh, of last year, right before the, the mayoral primaries, the other uh, local primaries, with the idea of taking a proactive view towards the ways that technology can actually help make the city work better and work, work more fairly. So this was a completely nonpartisan report. It wasn't written with one mayor in mind versus another mayor in mind, but it was thinking about the mayor and the council uh, and all the other citywide officials to find ways that off-the-shelf technologies could uh, be deployed in New York City specifically in order to make the city work better. And this is a good example of when we say applied research, it's what are real problems that we can take existing technologies and take them to. But there's also another side of the spectrum that I don't want to fail to mention where we look at the future. And my colleague, Anthony Townsend, is here, who I failed to thank. Anthony has been really the engine that helped make this happen on our side. And Anthony published a horizon scan this past fall, looking at 10 years in the future, what are the technologies that are going to be changing cities and how will cities be affected by changing technology. So I invite you to check that out as well. But the report was really about thinking on ways that technology uh, can help New York City improve its system and also improve its fairness. This report, over a dozen people worked on it, predominantly graduate students, but we also had some alums work on it, some folks from the controller's office and other uh, interested parties, but this was absolutely a collective effort. I'm happy to say, and it's somewhat bittersweet, uh, that it was led by our senior urban tech fellow here, Rit Agarwal, who now is the DEP commissioner uh, and chief climate officer. Uh, so I'm very glad that uh, the city has stolen him from us, but he really led this effort and was the main architect for the report. But it was very much a collective effort, uh, chapter by chapter. The idea of the report was really to think about how we could be proactive with regard to the role of technology. We interviewed lots of people who worked with technology and cities and thinking about ways that Technology can help systems work better and uh, more fairly. Met with elected officials after uh, the draft issued back in May. And then we actually met with a larger subset of community groups, over 100 groups, talking about reactions to the report and ways that it could be improved. And the final report was issued this past January. The screening criteria for what got into the report, this report didn't try to do everything. It was about areas where technology could be deployed by the city almost immediately. So literally off the shelf technologies that other places were using and how that could be brought to New York. We also concentrated solely on areas that the city had predominantly 100% control. So you won't see the subway mentioned here, that was a big issue, but the city does not have that much or really very much control of the subway system itself. So you won't see us mentioning New York subway system, but that doesn't mean it's not important. It just was beyond the scope of the report. And then could these ideas be implemented in a relatively short order? Could they be done in a term? Try to think about a politician's mindset. And this is something, while well, long-term infrastructure improvements are important, but are these ideas implementable in the near term? And that, that was important in terms of screening out what we actually began to look at. There are five main areas that we focused on. One was foundation. What do we need in order to get technology to help people and help urban systems improve? Bringing equity, and I'm assuming we're going to talk a lot about equity here, because if you don't have access to technology, it almost doesn't matter if the technology uh, is good, bad, or otherwise. But if we don't have broadband available to your home, then how are we actually going to be deploying the technology tool that we have? Urban systems are critically important to how cities function. We heard earlier today uh, that data and open data is empowering our understanding of improving systems. I teach a course here on urban systems that these young people were fortunate enough to take and everyone got an A. Um, <laughs> good job. Urban systems and how they really power the city that we live in. And we think of urban systems in terms of the hard system. So making 
uh, streets work better, making electricity flow better, but also the softer systems, the social systems or cultural systems or political systems that undergird uh, our city. Public engagement is also an incredibly powerful tool that we've learned over COVID that we have the tools of technology that were already here, and yet we accelerated our adoption to them in incredibly powerful ways that actually improved public engagement in a deep way. And then finally, future-proofing. What is What are the future technologies that we should be thinking about now? So as a non-technologist, full disclosure, I'm an urban planner, not a computer scientist. Um, there is a lot of talk in the tech community of disruption, and yet when you disrupt you know, a city, which is a pretty delicate system, whether it's the impact of Uber on the on taxi cabs or the impact of Airbnb on people who work in hotels, we need to be aware of how we can anticipate new technologies and what the positive and negative sides of disruption are. So thinking about a task force or a group that could actually think about what are the fu- what is the future of New York City and what are some future technology that we need to take into consideration. Privacy in procurement is something that for those of us that work in city or have worked in the city, that one of the gating issues for how cities can engage with technology is the fact that it's hard for them to buy new technology, that we get really encumbered in some of these institutional processes. So we talk a lot about the role of procurement and technology procurement in cities and how we could help um, accelerate the adoption of better technologies for cities. Techwity, which is a term I didn't make up, but I've heard of it. Um, not sure it's a real term, but bringing technology and equity together and how we could actually um, bring more equity to technology, which typically trickles down from the top down to communities. But can we find ways of actually bringing uh, technology to people's homes? I think many people here already know some of the fact that nearly a third of New Yorkers do not have broadband access. Many just use their phone for internet access. And we began to question, why do they just use their phone? Is it by choice or is it by necessity? But even coming up with an idea in this report of creating a broadband development corporation to basically say the city should be the one kind of laying the pipe and then private providers can always provide the wires in between it. But thinking proactively about, is this a role that the city should be playing? Is access to digital uh, infrastructure the same as opening a tap like water? So if if we're going to say that oh gosh, well, people just want to use their phone. That's just saying everybody has to drink bottled water. You don't have the right to turn a tap and take a shower or turn a tap and get water from from your sink. So thinking about the fact that the public should, in some cases, take a far greater role with regard to the deployment uh, of technology. Optimizing systems, which I talked about earlier, so everything from how we pick up trash to how we use our streets and anticipating uh, greater equity in terms of how we use our streets and thinking about the role of micro mobility in terms of bringing goods to people that you, we all live with a lot of congestion and certainly over the COVID pandemic saw the streets clogged with Amazon trucks and food delivery. Great for those that uh, those folks who were not comfortable going to stores, but also pretty intense uh, in terms of the impact on our street network and congestion, certainly air. And since some of us uh, are architects and designers, we also think a lot about the built environment. So other um, ideas of how we can say you can get rid of a third of the sidewalk sheds in New York City if you use drones for building inspection. And are there ways that we could safely use drones? And drones are probably a triggering word for some people. But are there safe ways that preserve privacy, but you can use new te- technologies to actually improve the built environment that we all... And then finally, thinking about how we could digitize democracy and improve public engagement through the tools of technology. As we all know, for the most part, every meeting that happened with public agencies or or community groups went online during the pandemic. And we actually thought that was a very powerful move to actually be more inclusive uh, in terms of public engagement. And can we use new communications tools to engage the the public in a deeper way? And then future proofing and thinking about, as I said, uh, what is the future of technology for New York City and how can we get ahead of the private sector to some extent in terms of anticipating the fact that we know there are technologies out there that are coming uh, and rather than being reactive can we be proactive with regard to uh, new technologies in the urban environment so finally uh, a little commercial for the report uh, please download it it's available free uh, as a pdf if you go to our website and i'm really excited now to stop talking and start to ask some of our students who authored many of the chapters on this report their thoughts specifically with regard to their research on the report, but then also the role of open data in crafting uh, the report in the first place. 
So before I do that, I'd like to introduce uh, my panelists. So starting at my left, Becca, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and where you're from? Hi, my name is Becca. I'm a second year urban tennis student here at Cornell Tech. I am originally from Boston, now living in Brooklyn. And before coming to Cornell Tech, John A. Advisor is economic development. Hi, everyone. I'm Preet Chagro. I'm a first year urban tech student. And prior to Cornell Tech, I worked as a data engineer at a software company. I'm from Calcutta in India, and I'm actually neighbors, almost neighbors with Becca. And I focused on the waste management chapter. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Connor Lyman. I'm a first year urban tech student here at Cornell Tech. Before coming here, I worked for a startup in distributed renewable energy in New York City called Blueprint Power. I still do some work for them part time. Uh, I'm originally from basically like the Hartford area, and I focused on renewable distributed energy. Great, thanks. So Becca, why don't I start with you? So talk to us about your specific research on this report and what some of your main takeaways from that work. So um, the section in the report that I focused on was ways that we could use technology to improve access to public benefits, distribution of public benefits, so SNAP, cash assistance, benefits like that. So I think some of the biggest takeaways, maybe obvious to some people here, applying and renewing benefits is really time consuming process, confusing, it's repetitive, but it doesn't need to be. Um, so we've seen a lot of states from Michigan to California who have revamped their processes using mobile phone web services to make it a really quick and easy and relatively less painless process, uh, less painful process. And so that was the first one. The second was that like if you look across New York State agencies, there's tons of digital platforms um, and applications, but there's not a lot of similarities. So for a person applying across different agencies, of which many people are, you have to relearn the interface and you have to relearn the language and that's a difficult process. And then lastly, I think the biggest takeaway was that in this case, really the challenge isn't the technology being new or complicated, but in creating data agreements and interagency like data sharing and like standardizing their sharing of data. Yeah, we found that throughout the report that, and this is no, uh, again, no shame on the city, but a the city agencies are not necessarily structured to share data longitudinally between them. They work very, some of them work very well in terms of vertical integration of their data systems, but not across uh, platform, which is also why some of the work that Data NYC uh, and others do to help tie these together in order to put it out to the public and represent it is such an important uh, gap to fill. So uh, Priksha, talk to us about the sanitation. Particularly around waste, I think the most kind of revealing fact that we wanted to uh, highlight was that the city hasn't really fundamentally upgraded its waste management technology when it comes to waste management since the 70s. And that really manifests itself in the key ways that we highlighted in the report. And the first being that we send too much waste landfill and that hurts not only the city's budget but also our environment and the second problem uh, that we highlighted is that we use our sidewalks and our streets as kind of storage for our trash a lot of our trash we store in plastic bags because the city doesn't have uh, a mandatory composting program a lot of the waste in our almost 30 percent of our of the waste that we send to landfill is compostable waste and so this leaks, the, the organic waste in our bags decompose, leak out into our streets and attract rats. Um, and as was mentioned this morning, that's a problem. It, it's a growing problem in the city. And it really affects quality of life for New Yorkers across, across the city. The third problem that we highlighted was that our waste management, our waste collection is inefficient and that the city collects waste on fixed routes. So even though uh, the city's collection trucks are enabled with GPS, we don't really have dynamic data about people's waste generation habits and behaviors to enable turn-by-turn uh, -turn routing and uh, optimize trash collection in a way that's not wasteful. And so we often see some overflow, some trucks are overflowing with trash, whereas other trucks are half empty when they come back to the vehicle. That's pretty wasteful and inefficient. And really to tackle some of these problems, we came up with three kind of 
key technology opportunities. The first one being try and handle as much, a lot more waste on site where it is generated through small scale anaerobic digestion. Whatever cannot be handled on site should then be containerized for storage. And the pickup of these, of this trash, this should be combined with kind of semi-automation of trucks. So Currently, our sanitation workers manually lift and take our plastic bags and put them in trucks. But retrofitting t- trucks with rear hoists would enable automated collection of trash. And then the third opportunity was to fully digitize collection uh, through in-cabin technology as well as a sensor technology in these containers. So that drivers, when they come for trash collection, can dynamically change their routes based on where there's a need for collection and where containers are ready to be empty. Yeah, it seems incredible that in this day and age, the amount of data we have or don't have on something like trash collection is a pretty repetitive process. It seems um, a little unforgivable at this point. Connor, tell us about what you work on. Sure. So the main motivation is climate change, really. And New York City and the state both recognize that this is a very important issue. And the real kind of energy goal from that standpoint is basically to electrify everything. The This is mainly done through the gas ban is the biggest one in the city that we've seen recently. So new construction, not having uh, gas hookups for heating and cooking. Local on 97 is basically an emissions or carbon cap for for large buildings in the city. And uh, the other piece of that is if we electrify everything, we also want to produce that electricity cleanly. So that's really solar and, and wind are the two big ones. One of the issues becomes that technology is a little intermittent. You can't just decide to blow the wind harder, shine the sun. What do you do at night if it's really calm? And so the real solution there is to store energy, especially excess energy made during the day when the sun is shining brightest, but maybe energy consumption is lower so that you can use it at a later point in time. This is typically done through actually pumped hydro is a big storage opportunity where you literally put water somewhere higher and you basically create like like an artificial um, dam or river. And then you let that water run through a turbine when you need more energy. And that's obviously not really possible in a place like New York City. So one of the other big forms of energy storage is battery storage. But again, large scale batteries can take up like the space of multiple football fields, which we don't have a lot of free ones in New York City. So then you kind of go from there to say, what if we distribute batteries throughout the city? or battery storage technology. This could really transform how energy works in New York. And right now, the way that energy is distributed in New York is through these really heavily polluting what they're called peaker plants. So if you look across the river at Ravenswood, that is maybe like the closest one we can see. You can see one in Manhattan if you look down to this. There's another one up where I live in Astoria, off by Dittmar's Boulevard. But they're heavily polluting because In the past, they've been coal fired. They're still natural gas fired and they contribute to high rates of asthma in local communities. And they are basically like the poster child for environmental racism in New York City. That and also maybe highways being cut through neighborhoods. So we have an opportunity by distributing energy storage to not only increase clean energy production and utilization in the city, but also to address some some historic wrongs that have And the state and the city both recognize this. There's multiple goals that have been put out for energy storage. Um, Actually, the report is now a little out of date uh, because the state goal was three gigawatts of energy storage. And in January, that was doubled to six, uh, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah, no, energy is certainly a key issue when it comes to decarbonization. We, in fact, took some of the students to visit an enormous cogeneration plant atop Hudson Yards last week, but not everybody yesterday long day. But not everybody has a couple hundred million dollars to just spend on building their own private um, utility. So thinking about ways that the the city can really uh, optimize this system. So I can't uh, avoid talking about open data. So I've asked, I want to understand what was the role of open data in your research? What did you learn? What were your takeaways in the role of any specific resources that you could point the the audience to? Raksha, I'm going to start with you. So I looked at monthly data, so aggregated of refuse. Is that better? I don't know. Oh. I'm just going to, for the waste chapter, looked at aggregated weights of refuse, paper, metal, glass, plastic, and organics waste. This was available by Sanitation District. So one of the problems, actually maybe the main problem with data, especially when I was working on this report, was that we don't have granular data about people's waste generation habits. We have 
data that's available at the sanitation district level, but really no data at a neighborhood level or a block by block or a household by household level, which makes it really hard to kind of really tackle the waste problem in a way that's that treats waste management as a utility. We pay for water and we pay for electricity. And so there's this like customer relationship that the city has with uh, the residents when it comes to water and electricity. And that just doesn't exist for waste uh, because waste is a free service. And mostly it was looking at aggregated weights at the sanitation district level. I also looked at the mayor's management report for data on kind of budget, the fiscal budget. So how much the Department of Sanitation was spending for exporting our trash away to landfill, as well as in collection, actually shocking how much the city spends to collect our trash. And it's like twice as much as it costs to even export, which already is a lot of money. And then I also looked at 311 reports. Complaints was a big one. And at one point, we didn't include this in the final draft, but at one point we have two pages on rats. (laughs) <laughs> decided it was way too much. So scrapped a lot of that out. But it was actually pretty revealing in that March 2020, the beginning of the pandemic, rat complaints went down a little bit and stayed low for a little while when people were still indoors. But right as soon as outdoor dining started and people started coming back out onto the streets, rat complaints went up and stayed consistently higher than historic rat complaints. And that problem just hasn't been resolved. But I really <laughs> enjoyed going down that rabbit hole. But rat complaints was a big one. We also looked at noise complaints and uh, illegal dumping. That was also one run reports for illegal dumping. So it sounds like there's definitely uh, a lot of work to do when it comes to getting better granular data on the kind of waste collection, like you said, optimizing how trucks are going and what they're actually picking up. So what was the role of data in your project? Yeah, energy is difficult because it's an interaction of the city, the state, and utility companies who all have different interests and different requirements of what data they provide. So I actually found three separate data sets on battery projects in the city that for the most part were all completely different. And some of them were aggregated by the city. Some of them were provided by NYSERDA, which is a state agency. So that was pretty just shocking to me. I think open data for energy is probably more of an opportunity that we have not risen to yet, as opposed to something like 311, which is like an incredible data set. So it's definitely difficult to parse out everything. And the way that I then approached it was, well, I I know that NYSERDA is maybe like the best agency in, in all of this. So I'll trust kind of their data, or they're the ones who run incentive programs for these projects. So they're who I would expect people are turning to the most. But there's also not a lot of great data to even track things like the state's goal just doubled. Like, where can I go to see some sort of dashboard? Not only what are the different goals that the city and the state are setting, but how are they doing at reaching that? One other like data set that actually was really great, though, was Columbia researchers put together a great data set looking at individual blocks in the city and baselining their, their loads to give you an idea of where electrical demand is highest. And also Urban Green Council has some great data sets and also modeling to look at different scenarios of, as we start to convert a lot more gas fired things to electric, like heating and cooking, where do we think that that electrical loads and therefore maybe also the potential for blackouts or brownouts could be increasing. And they have some great scenarios there of if we just electrify everything versus if we also include storage or we include solar and storage, or we also retrofit the buildings and make them more more energy efficient through insulation and that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of good work out there, but you have to dig pretty hard to find. And, and this was a problem I've had at work too. We got to the point where it was so hard to just get meter electrical meter data for an individual building that we built our own uh, meter because it was just so difficult to, to work through the utility on that. Yeah, we've heard a lot even about um, submetering. So those of you who don't know, here on campus, the Bloomberg building right across from you, that's a a net zero building. But again, not everybody can build a net zero building in New York City. It takes a university with the mission to do it. But we also have Passive House, which a couple of you live in, right next door, which is uh, one, one of the largest Passive House projects in the country. But and that required submetering every floor, required having much smaller windows, it required having 14 inch thick uh, walls in order to hyper insulate 
Uh, and again, not everyone, and given the age of the building stock we have in New York, we can't build these buildings again and again. We have a, a real aging building stock. But the idea of just trying to get more data to people uh, so that we know that our electricity is incredibly dirty in July when it's a hot day and everybody has their air conditioning running. And guess what? Not so dirty in you know winter when our loads are much, much lower. So even just pushing out that data to people, uh, I think, could be very useful in terms of like changing uh, behaviors. Becca, what was the role of open data in your... So on the open data portal, probably the two main data sets that I use for one, so Access NYC is a app that and website that was put together by NYC Opportunity and they, and it, it's like a front door to benefits. So you can go on and you can put in a couple of high level demographic characteristics about you and your family, and it will recommend a list of city, state, federal programs that you might be eligible for in terms of benefits. And so they've created a great data set and API. So you can download that data and get a really comprehensive view of how many agencies are involved in benefits distribution, what benefits does each agent, is it each agency responsible for? So that was the first way that I got it. An overview of the landscape of benefits and agencies involved. Second, there's a math and cash assistance enrollment counts data, and that was really helpful, but maybe the most helpful, similar to what Connor had said, was um, actually agency data. So the HRA, the Human Resources um, Administration, puts out a monthly fact sheet um, with enrollment counts for a lot of their program. And actually two, well, four local laws um, passed in uh, 2019 that required audits. So I think a big challenge is there isn't a lot of data despite having these mobile websites, et cetera. There isn't a lot of data on usage um, or the breakdown between who signs up via mobile versus phone versus insight. And I think that's really, that kind of data is really important. So it's only published really through audits and there is also one more these quarterly reports on the number of instances where people were denied um, cash assistance or SNAP and the reasons for those denials. So those are both really rich data sets. If anyone's interested, I highly recommend. Great, thanks. I'm going to have one more question to the panelists, but I want to also get a couple of questions from the audience to start to tee up your questions in your head. Pretty quickly, what would you what would you have liked to have gone further on? Because this report was a relatively finite time period. You know, we could have just kept going, going, I'm sure. So what, through your research, you like, that kind of piqued your interest that you'd like to go a little bit deeper on. Yeah, sure. So a big a big part of one of the things we were originally going to recommend in the report was changes to the fire code. So in New York City, until very recently, you could not install lithium ion batteries in your building because of the fire code. And then we had a mid-December deadline to finish the report. And in mid-December, they passed a a law to update the fire code so you could have batteries in your buildings. So that was a great change, but now I just am very excited to see where that goes. So just seeing what does that do to change the uptick of these sorts of projects in the city, I think is going to be really incredible to watch, or I hope it will be. And the other thing is, is probably back to somewhat similar, the idea of tracking these projects. I'd like to do more work to see. There were some times where I would open an article from 2016 or 17 that the de Blasio administration set a solar and battery storage project goal by 2022 or something or 2025 even, but then I would never see anything about how are we doing on that? I think that is really key because if we want to push forward the energy transition and tackle climate change, we not only need to set these aggressive goals, but we also need to track and grade ourselves against them and make sure that we're actually doing work. Yeah, that's a great point. Becca, what would you have liked to have gone further on? So with benefits, obviously the city in a lot of these cases, especially with cash assistance, you're giving money directly to individuals. And so I think that something that we started to get into at the end of the report was looking at digital payments and city digital payments specifically and opportunities to think about equity and supporting or connecting underbanked and unbanked New Yorkers through city systems to the digital economy. And I think there's yeah, a lot of opportunities. Uh, Becca? Yeah, I think one big thing one big concept that we would have liked to maybe go deeper on is illegal dumping. I think this morning it was mentioned the Southeast Queens. Uh, I think that's one area where Community Board 12 has recently reported like a lot of a, a huge increase, a huge spike in illegal dumping. And I think lately 
for whatever reason, in the last two years, illegal dumping rates have really gone up in certain neighborhoods, especially in the outer boroughs, especially in the less dense parts of the city. And these tend to be lower income, non-white communities. And again, because illegal dumping data relies on who picks up the phone and calls 311, we just don't have to really see in real time where the problem areas are. Uh, it we rely on people showing up to community board meetings or bringing to attention that there is a problem in their neighborhood. And so I'm curious to see what where we head with where, when it comes to illegal, illegal dumping. I think a lot of council members in a, um, particularly problematic districts are uh, providing discretionary funding for illegal dumping. So they're, they're providing funding for cameras to be set up in their neighborhoods to monitor their streets and have those additional eyes on the streets to combat illegal dumping. And the city is working closely with them. But I think the rate at which this is happening is, is still slow. So I'm curious to see where else we can make a difference, uh, whether that be partnering with the police department to use their cameras, because the, currently the Department of Sanitation can use images from cameras to enforce illegal dumping, but they just don't have access to, again, an interagency problem to the police department's cameras to, to enforce uh, violations and to, to charge people for violating and for illegal yeah, we spent a lot of time on the report uh, on the role of automatic camera enforcement, which is somewhat controversial, but it's incredibly powerful when you have speed enforcement cameras in school zones, for example, and the numbers are staggering in terms of number of tickets that are given out for speeding in, in school zones versus tickets that are given out by the police department. And one proposal in the report was actually the opposite of saying, if the police have all these cameras, what if we had agencies have cameras where they didn't share the information with the police? So. DOT having cameras that are purely about enforcement or having the sanitation department have cameras that were solely about the cleanliness of streets and actually separating out these areas to deal with some of the privacy issues that folks are so rightly sensitive to. So I have a bunch more questions, but I want to open up to the audience to see if we have any questions. Thank you. I'm Carlos. Uh, so question, what was the impact of COVID in your report and more specifically, I mean, given, given the timeline of the report overlaps with COVID, were there themes at the start? The report that you thought weren't as important and raised up through COVID and changes in society, and likewise, things that weren't as important? That's a great question. I would say one of the best, oh, I don't know the right word, the silver lining of COVID, we had a lot of time to research. So that we were not, we were not in class in person. So I think we had a lot more time to go deeper on this. I would say as a practical matter, it made interviewing, and I want you guys to chime in here, easier because you could actually find people, but you couldn't really have like working groups or uh, in-person sessions. I'm curious if you found access to original sources easier due to COVID, if you could just Zoom with somebody. I would also add, in, in addition to that, focusing on digital, digital services and benefits. A lot of cities were forced into this pathway because centers were closed. And so thinking about would this technology work, we were like living in it being tested. And so you could see firsthand, like, what was the uptake? How are people reacting to it? And so that could influence the recommendations that we made were based on what was happening on the ground, which was like directly. For the conversations that we had around waste, I think what was really interesting is how a lot of the dialogue was focused in on changes that were observed as a result of COVID. So whether that the increase in outdoor dining has resulted in more trash on our sidewalks. So we're seeing more rats on the streets and therefore the city is trying to combat that, even though we've had the rat reduction program for a while now, all of a sudden, everyone cares about it more. And so there were a lot of things that just became more visible as a result of COVID, it seemed. But also, I think what was really eye-opening is that, like for me personally, just realizing that a lot of what happens in the city's waste management is just extremely reactive. I think what Michael mentioned, rather than uh, proactive. So they really, we really never anticipated some of the things that like happened as a result of COVID, which might be why we had the private haulers still driving through Manhattan, like Times Square, even though it was completely like a ghost town for months during COVID. There was no trash to pick up. And yet there were these trucks 
driving the same number of miles, still on the same routes where when like businesses were not really there and there was no trash to pick up at all. So that was pretty interesting to just see how some of those inefficiencies really became more visible during COVID. Uh, yeah, I'll add actually one similar about inefficiency with COVID. One of the things that I learned and was struck by is that a lot of large office buildings in Manhattan, especially where you're getting the most emissions just because of how large they are. During COVID, their emissions could have gone probably a lot lower, but there's actually a lot written into tenant contracts about minimum environmental requirements in the office buildings where no one was going to work, but they still needed to keep, you know, a certain number of lights on, keep the room at a certain temperature, which is pretty striking if you just think about like, like how efficient that is, similar to you're still driving the same exact truck routes, even though the distribution of trash has changed. And also like it, that, just like everything else, it changes the distribution of energy. If everyone's working from home, suddenly what you would expect as a normal kind of electrical consumption throughout the day for an apartment has really changed. It used to be you get a spike in the morning when everyone wakes up. It's pretty low during the day. If you had solar panels on your apartment, maybe that's going back into the grid. And then it spikes at night when people come home from work. But if you're working from home, you don't really get that valley in the middle of the day. So it, it changes that quite a bit. Yeah, and I think in general, what we learned with what each of each of the panelists have said that the technology was a real accelerant. COVID was a real accelerant to technology adoption in, in a variety of ways. And I guess there's still a huge question on what's going to stick and what's not going to stick. And we don't know that yet. But the, I think there was actually a benefit to doing the report during COVID in that like some of these tech adoptions on city services were happening in real time. Rick O'Connor, I published the Roosevelt Islander. I was just wondering, what were some of the biggest obstacles you found in acquiring some of the data you needed uh, for your projects? And what improvements would you suggest to be able to get that data in the future? And I was wondering if you had any data on asthma uh, incidents near the Ravenswood power plant. So any problems with acquiring data? Yeah, like I mentioned, a lot of the data that I used ended up coming from comptroller reports, budget reports, HRA audits, which are hundreds of pages of PDFs. So it's about making data sets um, from these PDFs. So I think two things that I would love to see. One, are access to the agency data in a way that you can use it more easily. And then two, yeah, like I had mentioned, now that we're using all these digital services, there's more measurements. Obviously, we don't need to measure everything, but certain key steps, like why do people fall out of the application process at step X? is an easy thing to measure and an easy way to make applications and city services user-centered. Yeah, with trash, I think, like I mentioned, we don't pay for our trash and it's really hard to change behaviors and incentivize change when you don't have to pay for something. And I think the city would really love to have that customer relationship with, I think they envy water and electricity because they wish they had that type of c customer relationship with the residents of the city. And then, and I think they're trying to start doing that a little bit through targeted message for the curbside composting program, for instance, but it would have, I would have loved to see more granular detail about block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, household by household level trash generation habits. I think that would have been really interesting. And I think some of the technologies that we are recommending, some of the changes that we recommend would really enable the city to collect that type of data. I think right now, you just don't have a digital twin for uh, the waste management system. So we just really don't have the ability or really the data and knowledge to adapt and be proactive when it comes to the city's waste management. Or predictive, or predictive. even something as basic as it's Christmas or you know it's a holiday and there's going to be a lot more boxes. There's some things you could really predict. Uh, one last comment from Connor. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start with the, the asthma question. I believe it's the the rate of emergency room visits for for asthma related issues is triple or is three times as high in areas around peaker plants as opposed to the rest of this. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but that was basically the summary number. And nearly 80% of the people who live within a mile of peaker plants in New York City are low income or um, people of color. So it's historic wrongs just being layered on top of one another. And in terms of the 
you know, data issues, very similar to some of the things that I uh, mentioned earlier around the difficulty of getting really good electrical consumption data. Some of that's kind of expected for there's, you know, security concerns with making all electric grid information openly available. But if we distribute it, then that might actually be a little bit easier from a security standpoint, because it's a bit more, it's a bit more spread out. It's not as centralized. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. And, and thank you, Open Data. We couldn't have done the report without you.